All right. Well, good morning. Let's go ahead and make our way back to our seats. You guys are troopers, losing an hour of sleep and still showing up early to church. Uh, let's, let's open our Bibles to Zechariah. Zechariah, we're in chapter 4. Uh, those of you that are new, make sure before you leave, you grab a copy of our study guide. Those are in the back. That's a free gift to you. So please do grab one of those. Um, we use those in our small groups, and we use those uh, at our t- in our personal time with the Lord as well, as he continues to speak his word to our hearts through the book of Zechariah. Let me do this. I, I want to thank those that came to the work day yesterday. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Earl and his team did a great job of organizing yesterday, and our building looks a lot better because of it. So if you came and sacrificed time out of your day, out of your Saturday, thank you so much for doing that, for, uh, for serving us in that way. And if you're new, thank you for coming. You could have You could have chosen many places to come and worship Jesus, and you chose to worship with us. Uh, We pray that you feel welcomed, and we pray that you feel built up in the word uh, this morning. Zechariah 4 is where we're at. Uh, We're going to continue through the book of Zechariah, and we're in vision number five. So this is Zechariah's vision of a golden lampstand and two olive trees. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler alert, okay? Here's the spoiler alert. The Holy Spirit is in this text. This is a pointer to the power of the Spirit that perseveres us as his people, okay? Spoiler alert. Let's read the text. We'll get into it. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. The seven, these seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and I said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured? Then he said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you acknowledging our desperate need uh, for you to help us understand this text, this difficult, we would, we, have, we, would, we would be honest in admitting this obscure text. I mean, even Zechariah the prophet said, what are these? So Lord, we need your help. I ask through the power of your spirit that you would help us understand your word. You would apply the balm of the gospel to our hearts. You would point our eyes to Jesus as your spirit does a work to build your church. We love you, and we ask these things in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen. Well, I know what you're asking, and I asked the same question at the beginning of this week. What in the world is this? I asked this question. How, Lord, am I going to show up Sunday and preach a sermon about a text that's about a lampstand, an obscure lampstand, and these two olive trees. Don't lie. You're asking right now, what in the world does that have anything to do with me? Let me help you understand this. Last week, I began my sermon with a list of people. We began by listing those who felt as if maybe they were under the weight of condemnation. So let me give you another list for today. See if you're on this list. The the single mom overwhelmed by just raising kids by herself, the the sleepless nights, the the staying up late at 2 a.m., wondering if God sees the work that she puts in, her her pillow soiled with tears, the the man in the room that just lost his job, wondering how 
Is he going to provide for his family and pay the mortgage next week? The, the, the couple just consumed with the busyness of life on the rat race, right? Day after day, busy, constantly, just tired, worn out because they're pulled in so many different directions. The, the person who received the bad news from the doctor about their health, terrorized by, by the words, you might have cancer. All of them feeling the same thing, this sense of being overwhelmed by what's in front of them. The sense of, of wanting to quit, if, if they're quite honest. Uh, they've probably said things like this, like, God, where, where are you? Are you even here? Do you even care? Do you even see me? And, and what they would acknowledge is they need to continue on, to continue to persevere. They need some kind of supernatural presence inside of them just to get them going on to the next day. Now, you might say, I'm not on that list. I feel great this morning, but this text is also for you because you're on the other end of the spectrum. You could fall into the, the deceptive trap of, of self-sustenance, thinking that it's your strength, that, that, that you, can, you can utilize your strength to endure uh, the, 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 the thing we call the Christian life. So what does this have to do with our text this morning? Well, remember, remember whom the audience is, okay? Remember, this is written to a group of returned exiles who would have, would have began each day staring at this mountain of rubble, feeling overwhelmed, feeling like they don't want to continue on, asking the same things, God, are you even in this? Do you even see me? And they too needing this supernatural presence to persevere them through this work of rebuilding this once beautiful, now ruined, wrecked temple. And what is that strength, that supernatural strength that we need in us to persevere? All of us, all of us. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you're taking notes, here's, here's what the sermon is about. We persevere as God's people by the work of God's Spirit. Now I'm gonna show you that from our text. That's what this vision is about. This is the fifth vision. Don't forget what the fourth vision was, the vision of Joshua the high priest. God reinstated the priestly line in Joshua, I'm sorry, in Zechariah chapter three. Remember, how can there be a temple if there is no priest, if there is no one to mediate the covenant on behalf of the people? But God promised through that vision that there would be. The sins of his people have been forgiven. His grace renews what sin has ruined. We learned that last week. And this week, we see another person, Zerubbabel. God's telling us through this word to Zerubbabel, he will reinstate, reestablish the kingly line that once seemed to be lost. Remember, 40,000 exiles have come back because of the decree of Cyrus to begin this work of rebuilding the temple. Then they were met with opposition and hostility. We read about this in the beginning, I'm sorry, in the middle of the book of Ezra. And for 16 years, all that, that laid there was, was the foundation. They quickly began to work. Two years into the project, they were met with opposition, so they stopped working, right? They stopped working. So God raises up Haggai to say, get back to work. And then God raises up Zechariah to, to speak to the people after they're already working, to encourage them to get their eyes off of their, their current circumstances and see God's perspective. And I've argued that all of these eight visions are encouraging words to God's people encouraging words to God's people. And I, and I talked to you last week about the visions being like an hourglass flipped on its side, right? And God working from generals to specifics. And then he's gonna reflect that in the back half of these visions. But we're in the middle, we're in the, we're in the narrow part of the hourglass, we get specific people in specific places. Last week, Joshua. This week, Zerubbabel. And we find ourselves in the middle of the temple. I'll tell you why in just a moment. Last week, we, we saw uh, uh, the work of Christ, right? As, as uh, Joshua being reinstated. Uh, God cleansing Joshua pointed us to uh, what Jesus has done for us. We call that Christology. The study of what Christ has done. This week, we're going to be pointed to pneumatology. We're going to see pneuma being spirit in Greek, what the spirit does in the life of God's people after God's grace has renewed them. That's why these visions are side by side. Okay? So we're going to see what I just told you. We persevere as God's people by the spirit. And what we're going to see is three movements in our text. Okay? There's kind of three parts. And each part 
we're going to draw out a reality of the Spirit that encourages us to persevere as God's people, okay? The first part, we're just going to call this the vision. It's just the vision. It's found in verses 1 through 5. Notice, the angel who talked with Zechariah comes back onto the scene. Some people say this could be the angel of the Lord. I don't think so. The angel of the Lord is typically identified as the angel of the Lord. This is Zechariah's guide. Remember, he was absent last vision. He's back in this vision. And Zechariah is in deep thought about what he had just seen. Notice the text says, and he woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. That word woke me actually means he roused me. Zechariah wasn't asleep. He was, he was in deep thought regarding vision number four, regarding what he had just seen, the cleansing of, of the high priest Joshua. And the angel of the Lord shakes him. Hey, there's something else the Lord wants to show you. And he begins the vision by asking the question to Zechariah, and notice this hasn't happened yet. Zechariah usually just tells us the vision. He has, to, he has to answer a question from the angel. What do you see? And here's what he sees. Verse 2. I see, behold, a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on top of it, and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. Verse 3. There are two olive trees by it, one on the right and the other on its left. What does Zacharias see? Don't try to draw it. <laughs> I tried this week and, uh, and got very frustrated because I still had a lot of questions, okay? And I wouldn't even go try to look up a picture of this online, okay? You're going to get about 50 different versions of what Zacharias sees. We can make sense of it, though. He sees a menorah. You guys know what a menorah is? A traditional Jewish lamp. You know, when you think of Hanukkah, you think of a menorah. You've got six branches coming out one side, six out of the other, and a stem that holds it in the middle. That's important, we're going to go back to the tabernacle in a minute. This is important. So he sees that, the lampstand that was in the, in the tabernacle, in the temple, but not just any lampstand. This is a, a mega menorah. This is, this is a menorah on steroids, okay? There's a bowl on top of it. I don't know what's holding this bowl up, and I don't know how that works. I, I, I want to think that maybe the hand of the Lord is holding this bowl up. It's filled with oil, and in the bowl are seven lamps, and each lamp has seven wicks. What is seven times seven, you math geniuses? 49. What is seven in the Bible? It's the number of completion. It's the number of totality. We got seven times seven. This is something even better. And beside this lamp, beside these bowls, are two olive trees, and that seems to be what perplexes Zechariah. Notice, he's got a lot of questions. He's got several questions, and it seems to be around, what in the world are these trees? Why would it be about the trees? Well, he, he probably understood what the lampstand signified. Why? Remember who Zechariah is. He's not just a prophet. He is also a priest. Chapter 1, we're told he's of the priestly line. Now, he was, he was born in Babylon, but he had a grandfather, and he had a father and a great-grandfather, who were priests, they remembered the temple. They remembered the lampstand in the temple. They remember seeing the high priest tending to the lampstand in the inner sanctuary. They remember, and they, I'm sure Zechariah heard stories, so this is something he would have been familiar with. He would have heard of, of God commissioning Moses to build the first temple, the mobile temple, the tabernacle, right? Do you guys remember that part of Exodus chapter 25 when God tells Moses to make the golden lampstand? Verse 31, you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flower shall be of one piece with it. And then as we read this uh, text about this golden lampstand, we see this isn't just any lampstand. This is a menorah, but it looks like something. It looks like a tree. God pointing his people back to when he was present with them in the garden, present with Adam in the garden, the tree of life. And we know even before this in Exodus chapter 13 when God saves Israel out of Egypt, I've pointed to this text several times through our study in Zechariah. How does he reveal himself as a pillar of fire during the night and a pillar of cloud by day? God is communicating through this, through this lampstand, through this light, his continual presence with his people. 
That's what light is always signifying to God's people. That's what the lampstand signified. And, and in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the tabernacle, the lampstand, if you guys can recall, was placed in the Holy of Holies. It was placed in the innermost part. And the text says, go back to Exodus um, 25. Go to verse 37. It's, Look, you shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamp shall be set up so to give light in the space in front of it. What's the space he's talking about? The blackness of the Holy of Holies. Remember, there was no windows going in there. Only the high priest could go in there. No one went in there. But that light was constantly on. And we read in Leviticus, it's the priest that constantly made sure there was oil in the lamp so it would constantly be shining in the Holy of Holies, reminding God's people that even in their darkness, God is always present with them. He has always done this through light. That's what the lampstand signified. But the gold of the lampstand signified something else. It signified the preciousness of God's people to him. The unity as well. Notice that the lampstand was made out of one piece of gold, not multiple pieces of gold. One piece of gold. We see the lampstand reappear too in the book of Revelation, right? In fact, we see something more clear that Zechariah didn't really understand, right? Why is this a mega menorah? Because God is revealing, uh, revealing to his people that in spite of their circumstances, that there is no temple right now, right? Remember, they're, re they're rebuilding. There would be in just a few years, but they're re rebuilding. There is no lampstand shining in the inner sanctuary. When Solomon built his temple, there were 10 lampstands in the inner sanctuary. There, there's none of that right now, but he is pointing to the day there will be a greater degree of light that comes. 49 a greater degree of his presence with his people. Now we know, remember I've told you, we interpret Zechariah through the lens of Jesus, right? How is that fulfilled? Jesus, right? Zechariah didn't know that this man from Nazareth was gonna step down into space and time and he would go inside the temple one day and lights would be flickering and what would he say? I am the what? I am the light of the world. And the very next chapter, he would open the eyes of a blind man and say what? I am the light of the world. Jesus was telling us he's the fulfillment of this lamp that, that Zechariah sees. He is the light. And by direct connection to Jesus, if we're in Christ, guess what we are? According to Matthew 5, we're lights too, right? We're lights too, but we're also the lampstands. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, the, the uh, Apostle John has a vision, and what does he, he see? Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven, seven meaning total, complete, golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man. Jesus is in the midst of the lampstands. In fact, we continue to read this vision, and verse 20 tells us the golden lampstands are the church. Jesus is walking amongst his lampstands right now. The light of the menorah revealing the presence of God with his people. Jesus fulfilling that vision. The, the, the gold of the lampstand revealing the preciousness of God's people. The church now fulfilling that vision. This would have been very encouraging to the remnant. Even though the temple lay in ruins, God seeming so distant, he will, he will make sure that they, his people experience a greater, more expansive degree of his presence with them. This leads to our first truth regarding the Holy Spirit. If you'll put it on the screen, if you guys have it. If not, I'll just read it. The Spirit of God radiates God's presence among us. This is what's being communicated to Zechariah. And he gets this, I think. Picture in your mind a, a, the flickering of lights from the, from the lampstand that only had seven wicks behind the curtain of the most holy place. Now picture this mega menorah of Zechariah's vision with a bowl on top of it and 49 lights, which by the way, this, this is so different than the lampstand because it, were, it was a, a priest that would supply the oil to the lampstand. Actually, God's people would bring the oil to the priest and he would make sure that the lampstand was constantly burning. But Zechariah's vision, there is no human intervention here. There is no priest supplying oil to this lamp. This mega menorah, so picture that in your mind, a, a greater light. This is the difference between one of those um, keychain flashlights, you guys know what I'm talking about, and a massive floodlight. 
which has been fulfilled in Jesus and ultimately his church. And there's a truth that needs to speak to our hearts this morning. The overwhelming demands of life, the craziness of our days do not negate this reality, right? It didn't negate the reality that God was always with his people in the wilderness, even on their most difficult days, even in their times of grumbling. All they had to do was look up. We have God's presence inside of us. Even in your darkest days, church, the Spirit of God is ever present with you. And this is encouraging. I've told you, these visions are encouraging. Do you know that? In your tears, single mom, and your weak moments, parents, and your questions and frustrations about losing your job in the middle of the rat race of your day, did you know if you are in Christ, if you have looked to Jesus by faith, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you? So God has not abandoned you. He has not left you. We have a better sign than a fire up above us. That's what the uh, Israelites had. We have God's presence in us through the power of his spirit. Now, we need to know that, but it's not just that we mentally assent to a truth. What do we do as Christians? We orient our lives around these truths. We live as if this is true. So if we really are the lights of the world who radiate the glory and presence of God to a lost and broken world, just as Israel was to do, remember they were to be a light to the nations, then we do the same thing. So teenager going to the darkness of public school this week, you need to know what you're, what you're doing. You're radiating God's glory in the midst of a broken world, in the midst of a dark place. You're called to do that. So your conversations at the lunch table should look a lot different than those of your unbelieving friends, shouldn't they? Same thing, working dad. When you go and you take your lunch break and you're around non-believers, you are radiating the glory of God. You are, you are a light to them. This is, this is not just something we think here. This is something we live in reality. The Spirit of God radiates God's presence among us. But Zechariah, notice, has, still has some questions. Look at verse 4. I said to the angel who talked to me, Well, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked to me answered, and he said, You don't know what these are? Implying, Zechariah, you should know. You should know what these are. What are the these? We're not sure, but I think these have to do with the two trees that supplied the oil to this mega menorah. But notice, notice the text splits here because something's going to happen. The angel's going to direct his attention to this person named Zerubbabel. So we'll call this second part of the vision the word, the word to Zerubbabel. Instead of answering Zechariah's question directly, the angel says this, verse 6, then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now stop there. Who is Zerubbabel? We learned last week who Joshua the high priest was. This week we're going to learn who Zerubbabel, the governor of Yehud, is. He's a descendant of King David. He's of the tribe of Judah. In fact, if you flip to the New Testament, he's there two times. You know where he's at? In the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 and in the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Luke. Jesus comes from the line of Zerubbabel. But notice, though this is a reestablishment, so to speak, of the kingly line, there will never be a king of Judah. Not, not, not the way they're thinking of a king, right? Jesus will fulfill this kingly line. We know that. Right now, who's king? Darius. Zerubbabel's governor. And we know from Haggai chapter 1 that along with Joshua, Zerubbabel was tasked with being the lead guy to, to rebuild this temple. Think of him not only as a civil leader, but he was the general contractor. He was the project manager. So you could imagine how he must have felt every day when he looked out at that work that laid before him. And he says, it's been here for 16 years. You know, my son's room is a mess. <laughs> I feel overwhelmed just opening the door. You guys know what I'm talking about? Maybe it's your garage. It's my garage too, if I'm, you want to be honest. And there's just so much organizing and cleanup that needs to be done. You know what I do? I just shut the door. So I don't even want to look at it. And this is exactly what happened. There was so much work left to do. They were just, hey, let's just not even think about it anymore, right? 
This is overwhelming. You could imagine him being so overwhelmed by what lies in front of him. But notice what God says. He says, it's not going to be by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Just in context, this is about rebuilding the temple, okay? I know this is a very famous passage of scripture. This is a word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, who's charged with rebuilding the temple, and he's saying, you're not going to do this the way you think you're going to do this. Do you know how the previous temple, the one that lays there in ruins, or lie there in ruins, do you know how it was built? First Chronicles chapter 22 tells us how it was built. This is the temple of Solomon, the great Solomon. David, who couldn't build the temple, remember he was disqualified from building the temple, charged Solomon to build the temple. And this is what the Bible says in verse 14 of chapter 22 of 1 Chronicles. With great pains I have provided for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver and bronze and iron beyond weighing. For there is so much of it, timber and stone too, I've provided. To these you must add... Look at verse 15. You have an abundance of workmen and stonecutters and masons and carpenters and all kinds of craftsmen without number, skilled in working gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Arise and work. The Lord be with you. Now here's the question. That's what Solomon had. Does Zerubbabel have that? No. He's got 40,000 complacent Jews. Probably not many skilled workers or carpenters. Certainly not the gold and the silver that Solomon had, not the human resources. He doesn't have a military uh, uh, backing him up. Not by mind, not by human power, not by material wealth. That's kind of the thrust of those two Hebrew words. That's not how it's gonna happen, Zerubbabel. It's gonna happen how? By my spirit. God is telling Zerubbabel, in the Old Testament, guys, the only resource that he needs to complete this massive, I would argue, overwhelming project is his spirit. The third member of the Trinity is going to empower him and his people, persevere them to rebuild this. And look at verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the top stone amidst shouts of grace, grace to it. In other words, he's going to complete the project. He's going to lay the final stone, and he's going to hear from the people, that was all of God's grace. This will happen. What is the mountain, though? What is the mountain that the, the Lord is speaking to and saying, you're going to become a plain? Well, I think there are three layers to this. Number one, it's certainly the stones from the ruined temple that lay in front of them. That's a lot of work, and that's overwhelming. There are no cranes. There are no bulldozers, and he doesn't have a lot of masons. He doesn't have a lot of carpenters with him. Number two, the opposition that still stands in his way. Remember, there were people that inhabited the land that did not want this temple built. That's one of the reasons why it laid there for 16 years unfinished. There was political opposition. And number three, the complacent sin of the people. He's the leader of a lot of people who have to do a lot of manual labor. You can imagine the complaints that he gets each and every day. That's overwhelming. But God says, hey, you don't worry about that. I'm going to flatten that. This will be built by my spirit. The second reality about the spirit. You guys, listen up. The second reality. The spirit provides God's power in us. Now, I want to ask a question, but I want you to take it the right way, okay? I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel here. But there are, in a sense, these mountains of opposition that reveal our inadequacy in our life. Right? They do. The point of the mountain was to show Zerubbabel, you can't do this by yourself. God gets us in a very low state to reveal something about who we are. We are weak people. Isn't this what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Right? My weakness reveals your strength, God. This is where we need to be. So there are what I would call these mountains of inadequacy in our life that are there for a good thing. They're there to reveal we're not going to be able to press through these things without the Spirit of God. So perhaps it's your health. And what I'm not saying is that God's going to heal you on this side of eternity. Perhaps he does. Perhaps he doesn't. What I am saying, he is going to persevere you through the power of, your, of his Spirit to get through that, right? 
That's what I'm saying. What is the mountain? It could be health. It could be a relationship that he says right now you can't have and you really want it. I'm not saying he's going to give you that relationship, but I am saying he's enough to persevere you and sustain you as you endure that. That's what I'm saying. What is it? Is it a sin that you just can't kick that you're trying to white knuckle through? Well, you can't do it. You can't put your sin to death in your own strength. What is the mountain of opposition that reveals your inadequacy? Because it's not going to be by your might or by your power that you overcome it. It's going to be by the Spirit of God that takes up residence in your heart because you've looked to Jesus by faith. It is the Spirit that provides God's power in us. Look at verses 8 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Who's the me here? Who's the me? The me is Zechariah saying. So Zechariah is also To affirm what the angel just spoke, go to Zerubbabel and say this, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house and his hands will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. So he he affirms the same thing. You're going to complete this. You laid the first first stone. You're going to lay the last stone, Zerubbabel. And notice this. Though the Spirit does the work, Zerubbabel is not a passive bystander. Is he? You might look at this text and say, well, if God does it all, if he's sovereign, like you've said, if his spirit, why do we need to do anything? Here we see, in a mysterious way, human responsibility and God's sovereignty. It is going to be the spirit that does the work. But Zerubbabel gets his hands dirty. He lays the stones. He lays the stones. Look at the very next verse. For whoever's despised the day of small things shall rejoice and see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, I don't know what the plumb line is. In fact, I read many different commentaries this week, and I got many different answers. In the Hebrew, that word's a little obscure. The original audience would have known. Zerubbabel's going to do something in building this temple that's going to turn these people's uh, attitudes around. They're despising the work now, the day of small things, and they're going to rejoice. That's what's going to happen. That's what this text is teaching us. But what in the world is the day of small things? Well, remember, there are many... I'm sure who thought that the work of rebuilding this ruined temple, which took up so much of their time, so much of their effort and energy, was just insignificant. Day after day, stone after stone, sacrificing their time, laying, uh, laying the stone, getting sweaty and dirty. Where are you at, God? What are we even doing here? I'm sure there are many who felt that God was surely absent. He was not with them in the simple task of placing one heavy stone on the other. I'm sure there are many of those that remembered the way that God moved in the book of Exodus and wanted to see God move that way. I mean, how did he move in Exodus? The plagues. Turning water into blood. I mean, parting the Red Sea. God, we're moving a big way. Can't you just get this thing back together and like, like the snap of your fingers? And sure, God can. We're even told there's a group, an elder group of, of people, of remnant that, that left uh, Judah that were taken away in exile that had seen Solomon's temple and they come back and they rebuild. And we're told in the book of Ezra, upon rebuilding the temple, they're crying, they're weeping, not with joy, but with sadness because they look at this temple and they think it's far less glorious than Solomon's temple. They despise the day of small things. Church, we're guilty of despising the day of small things. We're guilty of wanting to see God move in a big way, but overlooking the small ways in which God moves every day. Aren't we? That's us. We want God to move big. Move big, God. But we're not always able to see God moving in the day-to-day rhythms of our life. And it's good to want God to move big. right? It's good to want to evangelize the city of Cartersville, to see people saved, to come to know Jesus. May we have that vision. But you know what? Guys in the room that have that heart for evangelism, praise God, you do. But don't overlook your wife and children in the midst of that. You would look at that and say, well, that's a small thing. There might not be any glory in that, but God is certainly present in that. Or you guys that have the the vision of, of like foreign missions and going out and taking the gospel to the nations. We don't want to despise that. Praise God, you need that vision. But don't do it at the expense of you overlooking your neighbor who needs to know Jesus. You're willing to cross an ocean, but not willing to cross the street. Come on now. Don't despise the day of small things. It's good to want to go serve at a homeless shelter. 
That's praise God, big vision. But it's okay to go upstairs and hold a baby in the nursery too, isn't it? Don't despise the, the day of small things. What is it that you're despising? Small group? That's small things, but God is very much moving, right? Serving? What is it? Don't despise the day of small things. Now back to our text. We get to the final part of this text. So we've, we've got part one, the vision, part two, the word, part three, the trees. Zachariah's gonna get his answer. What are these trees? But notice in verse 10, it's split up in the Hebrew, and I think it's right. The angel comes back and circles around to the question. He said, these, these, are the seven, these seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. But that didn't, that didn't answer Zachariah's question. And I think that these seven are the eyes of the Lord. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit. We see this in the book of Revelation, the comprehensive nature of God's Spirit, knowing all things, His omnipresence. This is a, a reference to the Spirit of God. But notice, Zechariah is not satisfied. He says, then I said, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Verse 12, and he had to say it again. And the second time I answered, and I said to him, what are these two branches of olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? In other words, please answer my question. What are these olive trees? And notice in verse 12, we get a few more details. On the branches of these olive trees, we have two golden pipes. And what's flowing from them? Streams of golden oil, which we know is supplying oil to the bowl that, gives, that, that supplies the light, the, the, the light from the menorah. Now, if you know your Bible, you know oil is always representative of the Holy Spirit. Always. Always in the Old Testament, we see oil and the Holy Spirit um, um, kind of represented uh, by, by oil. And so here we see two olive trees supplying an inexhaustible amount of golden oil through these golden pipes to this mega bowl, this, I'm sorry, mega menorah. Zechariah still doesn't have his question answered. What are these two? In verse 13, the angel says, you should know, right? Do you not know what these are? And Zechariah says, no, my Lord. Then he finally answers. We get the answer. These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. What? Well, the English mask, the Hebrew here, the words anointed ones, that word is literally, these are the two sons of new oil. If you have an ESV, it should tell you that at the, in the footnotes. Who are these two sons of new oil that are supplying oil to this lamp? Well, there's really two good views, I, I, I think. The first says that these are Haggai and Zechariah, the two prophets who are speaking God's word, and we know God's spirit works through God's word to empower God's people, the lamp, to finish this rebuilding project. That makes sense. In fact, I can't say that's not a, not a, not a bad answer. I think that's a pretty good answer. But I think there's a better answer. I think in context of these two middle visions, I think these are two people, Joshua and Zerubbabel, the two leaders, the priest, the king. The priest, the king. Why should Josh, I'm sorry, why should Zechariah have known who these two olive trees were? Remember the beginning of this vision, he was caught up in thinking about Joshua. And the angel startles him, right? And he keeps telling him, You should know, you should know, you just saw it. You just saw it, this priest. And now I've told you this word to Zerubbabel, this king. Remember, God is reestablishing the priestly line and the kingly line. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. They can't truly and fully establish the never-ending supply of God's Spirit to God's people, can they? Temporarily, they can encourage them. Temporarily, they can be a vessel by which this is built, but they can't do what Jesus can do, which leads to our third reality. The Spirit is given by God's Son to nourish us. You know, the problem here is these two men are go going to die this supply of oil is mysterious because it never ends. It never ends. It's constantly flowing. How can these men who are going to die constantly be supplying God's people with God's spirit? They can't. See, what I think ultimately, these are two shadows. These two men and their two offices point to one person, right? The king and the priest. 
It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be Joshua, and it wouldn't be Zerubbabel. It would be one that comes after Zerubbabel, a greater descendant. It would be Jesus. The two olive trees are Jesus himself. I know that. Think about the text, church. Think about the text. Just as the lampstand depended upon the oil that the tree supplied, how do we depend on the Spirit of God? We depend on the Spirit of God through the work of Jesus, don't we? The Spirit is given to us by these golden channels, which I would argue are faith, channels of faith that come from Christ, exclusively from Christ. He is the two olive trees, and He stands beside the Lord of the whole earth, the Father, supplying His church with the Spirit. Do you see the Trinity here in Zechariah? Again, we see more fully what they only saw in part. And notice these channels are strengthened by the Spirit, poured constantly into the hearts of God's people as they are nourished by Christ. How are we nourished? How are we nourished? How does the Spirit flow into our hearts? What does Scripture teach us? As we feast on the Word of God, our bread. But here's the deal. We like to eat food that doesn't fill us. Right? We like to have cheap substitutes, or what my wife would tell me in the afternoons, those are just empty carbs. I, I love, I'll just go ahead and tell you my guilty pleasure. It's potato chips at about 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. They taste good, but you know what? They don't sustain me until dinner. They're empty carbs. They're cheap substitutes. Really, if we think about applying this, how are we nourished by Christ who supplies us the Spirit? How do we continue to, to press on through the power of the Spirit as we feast on the Word? But if we're honest, we don't always do this. If we're honest, we do exactly what I do. Instead of eating something that's going to sustain me till dinner, I eat chips. I eat, a, I eat a cheap substitute. And we do it too. We eat cheap substitutes instead of the Word of God, which is meant to nourish us and sustain us. I know it. How do I know it? Because many of you neglect reading your Bible for time on your phone on social media. And you wonder why you find yourself in this situation because you're not feasting on God's word. You're feasting on your phone. And hear me, social media isn't bad, but it can't be a substitute in your life for the word of God. And you would even say good things. You would say things like good podcasts and praise God for good podcasts and good books, but they are no substitute for God's word in your life. With the spirit to move in you, to continue to persevere you, you have to nourish yourself in Christ. And we do that as we feast on his word. And go back to verse 6. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This is a word to a king who's building a temple. And the word is, you're not going to do this in human might. You're not going to do this in human power. You're going to do this through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a pointer to Jesus, church, who built his temple, us, you and I. And he didn't do it by might or power, did he? He did it in the folly of a cross. A cross, when the mountain of opposition stood in front of him, hostility, politics, people, and our sin, God flattened it. How? Jesus went into the tomb, and Romans 1, chapter 4 says, the Spirit rose him up and declared him to be the Son of God in righteousness. It was by the Spirit he ultimately built his temple, his church. I want you to see that. And when the final stone is laid and our king comes back, just like they shouted, grace, it was all grace, what are we going to shout? It was all grace, it was all grace. But I need you to know something. If you're in Christ this morning, you have the Spirit of God indwelling you so you can persevere as his people. But you need to know, for you to get the Spirit, it costs Jesus something. That's a precious picture of having the golden oil poured into us. That's a beautiful picture. But it cost Jesus something for you to get the golden oil. What did it cost Jesus? He got the dark cup of God's wrath. This is a beautiful picture for us to be glorious golden lamps that radiate God's presence. What a beautiful picture. But you need to see it cost Jesus something. What did it cost Jesus he became our filth. He became our mess, as we saw last week, so we could radiate God's glory. It's beautiful to see that we get the light of God's presence always for us, but what did Jesus get so that we got that? Jesus got the darkness of God's judgment for us. 
And oh, how beautiful it is for us to see that we will always get the blessing of the olive tree. But what did Jesus get so you get the olive tree? He got the curse of the one who would hang on a tree for you and for me, for wretched sinners. So here this morning, church, I want you to see that true nourishment comes as we look to Jesus and his spirit strengthens us and sustains us and perseveres us. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, I would, I would plead with you to look to him by faith. You will get the spirit so that you can persevere. And Philippians 1, 6 says what? That he will indeed bring to completion what he began in us. He will persevere us and he does it by his spirit if the band will come up. I have a simple question to close, just a simple question of application. Whose strength right now are you walking in? So let me speak to both of those groups of people, those who would say, right now I'm in, I'm in a great place, and those who would say, you know what, I just want to quit. Whose strength are you walking in? Because both of you, I would argue, are tempted to think it's your strength. And you know how I know this? You know how you, how you, answer, how you know if you're walking in the Spirit? Just look at your prayer life. The greatest hindrance to walking in the spirit is not our culture, it's not our environment, it's not our circumstances, it's our self. It's our self. We are fooled into thinking that we are self-sufficient and we don't need God to get through our daily task. We do it all the time. The simple task of going to work, we do it every day, we don't need prayer. The simple task of, of feeding our kids, we, we do it every day, we don't need prayer. And then the difficult task. Have you neglected prayer in your life? I don't want you to. I want you to see that we, we draw our strength from the Spirit as we commune with our Father in prayer. So we're gonna do two things as we close. Number one, we're gonna repent. We're gonna pr- repent of, of not walking in the, in the Spirit and in the strength he supplies and acknowledge that oftentimes we walk in self-sufficiency. We walk in our own strength. We fooled ourselves, And then we're gonna go to the Lord in communion, okay? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we confess we don't often walk in the strength of the Spirit. And our prayer life proves that. How often we neglect pleading with you that we need you. We are weak and we cannot do this in our might or our power, but only in the power of the Spirit, which is given to us through Jesus, the olive tree. Forgive us. Turn our eyes to him who has given us his Spirit who's given us the golden oil of the Spirit because he drank the black cup of wrath for us. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.